everybody. Welcome to Digital Seniors radio show, Let's Get Digital. Um, today we have two very special guests join us. We have got Andre, who is one of our amazing volunteers who helps seniors all across Masterton. And we've also got Steve, who is the Head of External Communications for Chorus. Um, you may be wondering why we are maybe sounding a bit, I hope we're not sounding a bit strange, but we're also in little boxes. We're doing this over Zoom today for um, obvious reasons, I think. I don't really need to go into that. Um, but a big warm welcome to Steve and Andre, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we thought we'd invite Steve on to join us because we've had a few questions from seniors recently about the transition from copper to fibre. Um, so we thought we'd just ask Steve a few questions and get us to fill us in on what Chorus has been doing and all the exciting new changes that have been happening. Um, so Steve, would you mind just telling us a little bit just about what Chorus um, has been doing and about what fibre is to start with? Yeah, no, that sounds like a great idea. So, um, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me along to speak. So it's good to have this opportunity. So it probably the, the, the bit to start the story is probably uh, about 10 years ago, 2011, when New Zealand committed to starting to build this fibre network. And we always knew it's going to be a, a long time to build this. You know, it's throughout the country and it's not just uh, Chorus. There's other local fibre companies uh, in areas building parts of that fibre network too. Um, and around the time we started with this, we knew that the majority of people would be looking for their telecommunications needs to be met using fibre rather than using copper. So the point we're coming close to now and you know why you're, we're quite keen to have this conversation is we're getting close to saying um, now now's the time to start thinking about how do we retire the copper network. It's been you know serving New Zealand as well since the you know 1970s, 1980s, but it's on a technology that is getting increasingly hard to support increasingly hard to get the skills of the people you need to be able to support it. And actually, nothing fundamentally changes with fibre. It's just kind of the underlying technology that enables the things that you know and love today. So whether that's your landline or whether that's your broadband, those things carry on. The underlying technology of those things changes and with any change there comes a level of uncertainty and concern and i um, mean you know, that's completely right and that's the case for you know myself and others within the retail providers the sparks vodafones two degrees and others to make sure that we're telling a very clear story about what to expect from this period of change in the telecommunications world so um where that drives to a lands to today is um, this earlier this year, Chorus started a very small, very low key trial of what it would look like to withdraw uh, copper from uh, areas. Now, unlike when we did the conversion from um, analog to digital TV, there's no big bang date. Nothing happens with one single date when all copper services are shut down. Number two important thing to, to know and to allay any fears is if Chorus um, hasn't built fibre or one of the local fibre companies haven't built fibre where you live, then Chorus will operate, maintain, invest in the copper network in those areas. Nothing changes on that side. Um, what's then important to know is if you don't hear from Chorus, you're not in needing to do anything. Nothing changes on your service. So what we did is um, working with the government through the Commerce Commission, agreed a set of rules, if you like, of how can Chorus start looking to retire copper services. And when I said there's no big bang, there's no major event, what we're looking to do that is you will have seen around the streets in the wire or elsewhere, you'll have seen a little uh, cabinets, green cabinets usually, um, they're where we house broadband and voice electronics in and around streets. Those cabinets serve copper. Um, what we'll be looking to do is, as we've migrated everybody across and over onto fibre, or they've moved to another technology, 
will be looking to power down those cabinets. So it's not a case of people coming out and ripping copper from the ground or from the, you know, from the telephone poles. It's a an ability to turn off the electronics. You know, from an environmental persp um, perspective, it's actually a good thing to be able to do anyhow, and and then just let people operate through with with fibre again with all the same services that they had previous to that side. Now, the interesting bit into there is, you know, we um, at the outset of the fibre build when we started building the fibre network, we had a target, and the target was that one in five people will have connected to the uh, fibre network by 2020. Um, actually, when we got there, we've got two in three people have connected to the fibre network already. So we're well advanced of where we thought we might be or where, you know, the industry thought we might be in terms of people, you know, welcoming fibre and accepting and taking it on as their kind of the technology that they prefer to use. So that none of that takes away from the fact what we're doing at the moment is a very small trial of trying to make sure we understand very, very clearly what are the concerns of customers um, who are having to move from their copper connection because we want to turn that copper connection off. So that's kind of where we've landed today. Um, to give you an idea of the numbers, that's, you know, um, it's probably less, the, the trial we're looking at at the moment is less than 1% of our copper connections on the Chorus network. Um, and um, all going well would be looking to turn the first of those copper cabinets off sometime in October. That's kind of where we're, we've, where we've landed at the moment. So, um, sorry, I'm just, I just had to get myself off mute. <laughs> um, so, Steve, how does that compare? How are we tracking sort of um, globally, I guess, compared to other countries who would be doing this transition? Hmm. That's a, like a really good question. So um, probably the, you know, people will be able to tell by my accent that I'm not a true born New Zealander. Um, I, I'm an import from the UK in 2004. Um, so if I look to um, to where my parents are and to uh, family in the UK, the, the UK's equivalent of Chorus is a company called OpenReach. And they they operate the same way. They're part of BT, British Telecom over there. But um, And they've just said 2024, the copper network will be shut down, and that's their that's their approach and plan to it. Uh, our Australian cousins have gone slightly differently with that, and that they're kind of progressively migrating people off copper. But you have to remember that within Australia, they didn't build a full fibre to the home network. You know, New Zealand is one of the few countries, very few countries in the world, that has built a fibre network as extensively as we we have done. You know, putting fibre into places like Bailey's Beach and, you know, more or less holiday home towns um, is, you know, pretty much unheard of around the world even um, on, on that kind of capability side. So um, there's different approaches from different countries. A lot of European countries, they're, they're doing, begin doing the same thing. They're looking at going, how do we move people off the copper network and through onto fiber? And it really depends on the state of, you know, what the alternatives are and available. Um, I'd say we're probably, you know, we're certainly at the front end of that rather than um, a laggard who's following. So, we're, you know, eyes of the world would be looking at New Zealand to see how we manage this more so than the other way around. Mm. Gosh, well, that's quite good, isn't it? Mm. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. it's, you know, I think it's one of the things that's most um, strange to me. You know, uh, we've got a CEO called uh, JB Arusolo, and um, one of his, he's Australian, French originally, but Australian more recently. And one of his kind of, you know, I talked about um, two and three people have connected, um, you know, coming from Australia, where he's been for the last 25 years, his immediate line is, well, why hasn't the other third connected? You know, if, if that was available in Australia, people would be clamoring over one another to connect to it. So it's a it's it's an interesting kind of turn of, you know, w where people are in terms of, you know, doing these technology changes for their lives. And I completely understand it. You know, I, I come from my, my background with my parents is, you know, if something isn't broken, don't try and fix it. And I think that's probably where we're at with a, for a number of people are thinking, well, look, everything is, it's doing everything I need it to do. Why would I want to, why would I want to change? And um, 
you know, that's a job for, again, for Chorus and for the, the retail company, the broadband retailers and the phone providers to actually help people understand why fiber is as good as it is. And, you know, today in, uh, you know, a countrywide lockdown is one of the reasons why, um, you know, fiber is exactly that. You know, the things that is enabling us as a country to do, I recognize that not everybody can work from home, but, you know, there's a fair majority and a fair number of people who can. And if they're not working from home, then they want to be ent entertained at home or just keep in touch with family from home. And when you get to these technologies like fiber that have near limitless capacity um, to be able to do everything simultaneously. That's the real beauty of fiber. It's, it's not so much that, you know, video conferencing will work on copper. It's the fact that five of you could be doing it simultaneously uh, and nobody having that wheel of death, you know, in looking at you and going, why, you know, it's, it's not fair. Why did I get that? So there's, there's a real beauty to fiber that is, you know, something that, probably comes more to light in, in, in times like this when you're, when you're really kind of going through um, uh, a real need for great connectivity. It was, yeah. it was something actually that was seen in 2015. 2015 was a defining moment. And 2015 was when Netflix launched in New Zealand. And all of a sudden, people started realizing that they wanted great quality broadband in order to be able to watch without that buffering and being able to pause and fast forward without having to worry about it. So, you know, to a certain extent that, you know, the, that we outperformed our target of a 20% uptake by uh, 2020, you know, in, in, in part was due to the fact that Netflix kind of changed the game in terms of entertainment. Um, I noticed that Andre had raised his hand, so. <laughs> and then I took it away because yeah. I got shy. <laughs> <laughs> Steve. Yeah. Um, you talk about retiring the copper network. How do you, how do you think you would rate yourselves when it comes to retiring the copper network in relation to people over sixty? Hmm. Um, have you have you done a really good job there, or could we have done something better? So. I'll take you back to my the, the first bit, and and there's something I need to add to it um, that is a confusing point, but I'm going to bring it through and, and try and help people through with it. So, as I mentioned at the outset from our side, is we've we've done this trial with um, we're talking in tens or a couple of hundred of connections, and we've done that to learn. We've done this to, so that we understand what issues people have you know for example do people you know is it a business are they operating an ethpost machine does that need you know does it incur costs do they have a st john's medical alert that runs on the copper network yeah. how do we make that piece work um and so that nobody is in fear for concerns you know people who are worried about the fact that they you know feel they may not be able to dial 111 in an emergency what does that mean for individuals so all our work to date has been around that and I think, you know, I can speak for all those that I, I work with in Chorus and that is um, the, our more senior uh, residents are probably top of mind for all of us on that. You know, number one for me is is our medical alert side of making sure that, you know, things that are, you know, critical life-saving tools are yeah. there. So we talk with the, um, we've been talking with St. John's, we've been talking with others about making sure that in advance of us withdrawing copper, they're making sure that a free replacement unit goes to the homes of those with a monitor so that they don't need to be left worrying around it. Now, that is um, that is an approach that we you know we agreed this with the Commerce Commission. We agreed these this rules about how we're going to do this. So you know to give you a, a kind of a, an example of it, it's uh, minimum is six months notice um, as a starting point, um, and that we leave nobody behind. So we will only shut off, retire that copper network once everybody is off that copper network, or decided that they don't want any any form of telco, you know, telco connection, they'll do something different. So that's, that's kind of the number one piece into there. I think um, what some of the individuals you may have met have been caught with is um, Spark, um, ex-telecom, as was telecom, Spark now. Spark actually own a service that sits on the copper network. It's called the PSTN, it, but it's 
the plain old telephone system. The telephone system that we've known and loved since the 1980s is actually a service that is provided by Spark. Um, it is wholesale to other providers can offer it to. So it's, a, you know, it's something that could be available from another operator. Um, and the technology that drives that uh, our phone network, again, like the copper network, is very old. So there's big big uh, bits of electronics, almost not electronics, but electronics in exchanges around the country. Um, and those are way beyond their life cycle. You can't buy spare parts for them. You can't find the technicians who can look after, maintain and manage those. So Spark have been running a program throughout uh, New Zealand um, to shut down the phone network in areas. And when they shut down the phone service, they're also looking to shut down the copper broadband. And therefore, they're looking for their customers and their wholesale customers to migrate to a new technology. And um, I think taking that back a little step further and to answer your question, Andre, is, you know, I don't think Chorus or Spark or the industry as a whole has done a tremendous job yet of how we communicate this and how we talk to people around it. And it's a topic of conversation in industry forums that I'm across and in and that others are in uh, on a pretty much a daily basis of what more can we do to try and ease this? Because, you know, you and others who are outside that industry should not ha be having to try and understand the complexities of how the industry actually works to deliver yeah. these services. Yeah. And I think that's the bit that I would say we've got a lot of work still to do on. Okay. I've got another area that worries me. Um, mm. I'm, I live in a retirement village. Mm -hmm. So, and I, and I call on other retirement villages. So I've, I've got a pretty good idea on how they live and, and their digital lives as to where they go and, and, and the things that worry them. One of the things I don't seem, I can't get my head around, and I'm basing this on the questions that I get from seniors, is that when there is an outage, Chorus is normally the one that answers everything, and Vodafone Two Degrees and Spark are just, I don't know, they, they all they're doing is, is leveraging off your information. Mm -hmm. So what happens is I live in the village. My next door neighbor on the left is with Two Degrees. The one on the right is with Spark, and the one across the road is with Vodafone. Mm -hmm. Some of them are out, mm. and some of them are not. Mm. Now, from a village point of view, I would love it if I could just open one map mm -hmm. online, possibly. Mm -hmm. It says, Andre, it's only Spark, and it's this area, or it's, uh, you know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. a simple, because I, I, I do use the Spark map at the moment. I must yes. admit, it sits right in the middle of my homepage, mm -hmm. and that's mainly because most of the, uh, most, most of the seniors here are on Spark purely because of the relationship of the last 40 years. Mm. I think it was just a, a natural migration. And but the extra I'm, email address that everybody loves and won't exactly, let go of. Exactly, exactly. Mm. But every time there is an outage, I have a problem. Mm. So the first thing is their phones die. Mm -hmm. From my point of view, we're now trying to work out how we can inform people. And you can see where I'm going with this. This is really difficult because I've got to find the, the three neighbors that are on Spark. Then I've mm -hmm. got to report to the other eight that are on Vodafone and mm -hmm. the other 14 that are on Two Degrees. So we all have to try and work out how to answer these questions and, and keep them informed. That's the biggest thing I've got because some of them don't even know that they're not, that they're not connected, that they've lost power. Yes. Wow, you've, uh, the <laughs> you've raised. Uh, 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 there's a lot of. I'm questions. sorry, Steve. But no, I live there's a lot in of this world. In there. The no, problem is, I live in this world every day, yeah. and and I have to sit next to these people, and I can really see the hurt that goes on and yeah. the misunderstanding. Yeah. Let me let me try try this, and then just keep pushing me back if I'm if I'm losing the point from your side. So. Um, if we jump back into the you know 1980s 1990s kind of period there was pretty much telecom and you know you had your phone service there and you know your broad and your dial up broadband service even in the early days as it moved into broadband mm -hmm. um then one of the things that happened in the um mid 2000s was the commission commerce commission wanted to go we want to see more competition in this market 
And so a whole raft of activities happened that led to telecom being split up into Chorus and what is now Spark. And a whole raft of competitors joined into the into the mix. So all of a sudden there was Vodafone who were kind of were there, but you've seen brands like Slingshot, Orcon, um, yeah. Cool Plus, uh, My Republic, um, Two Degrees now. So suddenly choice became available. And that with that choice comes a level of you know challenge with it because to pull that one map together becomes more challenging because there isn't the you know we don't all share the same systems now you raise a very good point in that for the majority of those people come back to chorus each time because we wholesale our services um, and chorus is wholesaling broadband or voice services uh, quite often it is chorus that might be supplying two degrees spark and yes. vodafone exactly Quite often what will happen out into the streets is that a someone will be working in the roadway and they either didn't quite do all the um, requirements of where they can dig safely and where they can't, and they put a, a digger bucket through mm. a chorus cable. And so that will take out some of those, um, those broadband retailers. So let's say it's Spark, you know, Vodafone and, um, and Two Degrees. Now, the complexity that sits in the telco world means that each of those providers have their own networks mm. and some of them route traffic differently to others. So it might mean that Spark, because the way they route their traffic, is still able to provide a service to Spark customers but Vodafone or Two Degrees, their, their services would stop. And it's a very difficult thing even within the industry to know because of one cut cable or yeah. either whether that's copper or fiber, who we've actually impacted and who we've affected. We communicate out to everybody, out to all our retailers, out to all of the broadband providers and let them know. And then they have to update their own sites to be able to go, okay, we've been told by Chorus there's an issue here and this is resulting in an outage for our customers. Um, another might be able to say, well, we know there's an outage there, but none of our customers are affected because we have an ability to route our, our traffic differently. So I think it's going to be a long way off before you can have your beautiful map where you could look at which services have been impacted by which provider in, into the home, into there. But you do so, bring do it go. I'll let you so go. We we had an incident a while back. I think you remember mm. which one it was, where there was a digger incident in somewhere below Hastings. Yes. Yep. I and do. it was yep. and it was the spark portion of the cable mm -hmm. that went um, down. Mm. So, so um, I had two neighbours sitting here. The one said my internet's down. The other one said no, it's not. Mm. Because the one was a spark, yeah, and the it's, other one was somebody else, and and they were arguing amongst each other. But and then I found out that it was really, really difficult to try and explain to them what had actually happened, because they find it really difficult to talk about mobile data, broadband, and fiber. Yes, um, really, and, difficult. and those complexities um, won't readily go away. I'm afraid. Oh, I need. I help. mean. Uh, one thing that, you know, a couple of things that kind of raise that come into that a little bit further is, you know, how we all are in the home. So the things that we do have control on in our homes is is twofold. So, you know, um, one of the concerns I've heard a lot from communities around is this kind of um, this view that um, what's well, correct in many ways on a copper network, if you have a phone plugged into the wall, um, there's, you know, it can, in terms of a power outage or something goes wrong, you can still have your phone service. And yeah. the way that works is there's batteries in our street cabinets and generators in our exchanges that allow us to give power back down the phone line in order to make that work. Under for fiber, that doesn't work. Fiber is sure. a passive technology, so it's just bursts of light that travel very well at high speed over a fiber cable. So the things that you can do in your home to support that are, you know, twofold. Is number one, if you're in a good mobile area, is to make sure you've got a mobile charged up, ready to go, and and good to be able to use. Bearing in mind that you might be able to then use tether that for mobile data. 
to make sure in, in, in the event that something has happened, you've got some ability to be able to have connectivity, be it a phone call or be it going online briefly. Yeah. Um, and the other option is to um, um, the other option is to look at things called like uninterruptible power supplies, where they're kind of a factory, a large battery that can be in your home that can power you know, for a fiber connection, it needs to power two things. That white fiber box that sits on the wall, uh, that's yeah. called an optical network terminal. They're not going to pay for that, though, are they? No, uh, yeah, no, that's, I, I think this is probably a, this is probably a, a, probably a step too far. They're quite it's big units. It's a bridge units. too far. It's probably a bridge too far into there, but they are available. They can be used if it's a real worry for you, and particularly if you're in a, in a bad con a reception area. Just bear in mind that, you know, particularly for those who are more vulnerable uh, and use the responsibility for that under the Commerce Commission's 111 contact code does sit with the retailer. So they can talk to their broadband provider or phone service provider and say, look, I need to have connectivity in an emergency. If something goes out, what will you do for me? And the obligation on that then sits with the retailer um, to, to have a conversation. And it's an important thing to get, you know, you can log that with your provider and just um, know that they'll be in touch then to be able to help you make sure that you've got the connectivity you need in the event of an emergency. Mm. I'd love you to be with me when I go and visit some of them, but I think we're going to run out of time. Yeah, uh, I've been, uh, we do, Chorus does a, we do a, um, go out into the community a lot before we do a fiber build and sometimes post. And um, I think, you know, I, I would love to be able to do this more widely and it, it's great doing this today, but to be able to go in, you know, you do see things where you can help, but uh, I do understand and accept it's actually a really quite complicated area to get, you know, to get this all, you know, right down to the fact that a lot of people today have wireless handset phones and they need power. So in the power outage, those are the first things that stop working. So, um, you know, there are kind of challenges. Some we can do some about ourselves, others that um, are going to just going to be different from the past. And a lot of time, unfortunately, family has bought Nana the cheapest phone they can find, which is the old Nokia 1310 or something. Yeah. But a screen the size of a postage stamp, and they said Nana needed the phone, so we got her one. Yeah, I think you know, that that one that different. one is not the uh, not is not ideal. Yeah. All right. Mm. Thank you. All right, everybody. It looks like um, our time's nearly up. So thank you so much, Steve and Andre, for coming in. Remember that Digital Seniors is here to give you some free help if you're over 65. Our number is 0800 373 646. So give us a call anytime. Well, not anytime, between nine and five, and we'll help. <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora koutou. this is the elephant in the room, Michael speaking here. Good on you, Sarah. You got it banging on time. Uh, excellent program, but I will be ending it now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.